Hezké odpoledne. Moje jméno je Josef Patočka, působím jako výzkumník a kampaněr v Resetu platformě pro sociálně ekologickou transformaci, což je česká organizace, která se snaží podporovat transformaci směrem k sociální, ekologické a demokratické ekonomice. A v rámci tohle úsilí jsme součástí taky pracovní skupiny pro nerůst při České klimatické koalici a zřejmě proto je tady mým dnešním úkolem moderovat debatu s naším hostem, jimž je Georgo Skalis, kterého představím za minutku. So uh, now I will switch to uh, English uh, to welcome uh, Georgo Skalis uh, with us, um, if only through uh, the internet. And Georgo Skalis is uh, one of the foremost uh, ecological economists in the world today, I would say, a professor of political ecology at the uh, Institute of Environmental Sciences and Technology at the Autonomous University of Barcelona in Catalonia, Spanish state. Um, and um, this uh, institute, Institute of Environmental Sciences and, and Technology in Barcelona, uh, is known in the, in the scientific or social scientific uh, world as uh, one of the major academic institutions, research centers, uh, connected to the IDEA, the research program, and the and the, you could say, proposal uh, pol or, a, or, a, or a also a political economic paradigm of degrowth, which uh, um, is this idea of the need to uh, selectively downscale, shrink the economy in the rich world to be able to achieve global uh, ecological and social uh, justice and, some, and, and restore the balance with the natural world because growth is uh, unsustainable uh, as and that's why the debate probably is called 50 years later this year is the 50th anniversary of the limits to growth report of the club of rome which has started the debate of of limits uh, about limits in uh, limits to growth in in the 70s we have been growing since then for 50 years and the the debate now in the face of of the of the um, in the face of the of, of, of the escalating and uh, um, uh, multiple interconnected crises, econ economic crises, ecological crises, not just the climate crisis, but the broader ecological crisis. So this is a debate that uh, Georgos has been intervening uh, in with uh, his scientific work uh, and his writing for some time now producing works such as uh, the growth a vocabulary for a new era together with other uh, researchers in defense of degrowth which is a book that has recently been published in Czech and we have it here and there will be the possibility to buy it after the uh, debate um, or limits why Malthus was wrong and environmentalists should care where uh, Georgos is uh, proposing that limits are something that we should actually uh, approach positively as something that we have to set ourselves individually and collectively to be free, which is an, one of the ideas that we will have the uh, space to explore here. Uh, but first, th there is the time for uh, Georgos' uh, opening speech or, or the keynote speech to, um, to introduce what degrowth uh, is about. And, and for that, I will pass uh, I will pass the word to him now. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, I understand I have 20 minutes for my first intervention, right? And then will be the interview, no? Uh, I'm very happy to be with you. I can't see you very well. I see the back of your heads as said, so I don't know who you are or how many you are, uh, <clears throat> but it's uh, pleasant to be, to imagine that I am in a documentary film festival in Prague, uh, 
so I can fantasize about being there and what would it be like. Unfortunately, I couldn't travel, uh, but I'm really happy for the opportunity and for the invitation and also for engaging with an audience that it's not, um, let's say, the standard academic audience or sometimes activist audience that I normally address. So in that sense, I hope uh, that my ideas can inspire you or inspire some thought uh, at that time, at that uh, let's say less graceful time, which is immediately after lunch, and it's uh, the time where sugar goes down in our brains. No? Um, I'm gonna intervene. Uh, I'm gonna explain two things that Joseph already mentioned. The first, and they both go around the idea of limits and the idea of how we come to think about limits and how we come to think about limits to growth. Um, the first thing that I want to talk to uh, is where do we stand uh, as scientists and as uh, societies, but what, do, what does science tell us of where do we stand as societies in relation to this prediction that was made 50 years ago in a report written by a group of young scientists in, uh, at the MIT in uh, Boston, where they wrote this report called the limits to growth, uh, that for some, according to some, it's the foundational document of modern Western environmentalism. And it was a scientific report using uh, models and computers but at, the same, at that time, you know, a computer was not a laptop where you could talk at Zoom, you know, it was like a huge monster that was occupying a whole room and then you would just use it to make calculations you couldn't do with your hand. So not very difficult calculations, let's say, that now we do at Excel. But at the time you needed these huge computers and they used these first computers at MIT uh, to do the first models that were looking at the... Uh, what would happen to the world as a whole if uh, industrial production, uh, global industrial production kept growing at the same pace that it had grown uh, from the 1900s to 1970. So they said like, okay, let's, let's see what we know. Let's see what relations we know exist between population, resources, pollution, industrial production, and then uh, let's see where this leads. And famously, this report predicted um, a sort of collapse that would happen, would start unfolding anytime between the 2020s uh, in the business as usual scenario that everything went as it was going up to then and nothing much changed to around 2050 to 2100 in some scenarios that they were more optimistic about the development of new technologies. So why was the collapse coming in these scenarios? The mathematics were complex, but more or less the dynamic that was playing out was like if the economy grows at a compound rate of two or three percent, this means at three percent, it means it doubles every two, 20 years. It's four, four times bigger in uh, 40 years. It's eight times bigger in, uh, in uh, 60 years, et cetera, et cetera. So an economy, um, that grows at 3% every year, doubles, and then it's four times, eight, 16 times bigger every 23 years, more or less, uh, if it grows at 3%. Um, given this dynamic, they found that uh, resources, resources uh, cannot grow that fast. The resources are more or less fixed. Maybe we can find more resources that we knew before. But at some point, they will start getting harder and harder to extract them. Or if not resources, and we have good technologies to manage resources, they found that the pollution the, that we will create in the atmosphere, and at the time, they didn't know, really know about climate change. They just mentioned it, uh, that heating of the planet could be a problem, but they didn't really know about that. It was like a very ahead of its time, let's say, uh, prediction. Uh, I said, if not resources, then pollution might catch up with us. And at some point, a population that was also, would also grow at that pace as long as there is no resource or pollution problem, at some point it will collapse. And this will be a sudden collapse. Why would it be a sudden collapse? Uh, they used 
a nice metaphor, which is imagine a huge lake and a small algae that is very small, but it doubles every, uh, let's say, then it was 20 years. If we talk about economic growth, but you can say every one or two years, the algae grows, doubles. So like this, the, the algae is small at the beginning and it's like nothing compared to the lake. Then it's two times bigger, then it's four times bigger, then it's eight times bigger. Suddenly, uh, the last period of time where the algae is going to occupy the, the, the whole lake is just going to be half of it because the last doubling is going to be from half to occupying the whole lake. So what they showed was that uh, the power of compound growth of these uh, continuous doublings of the economy means that at the end, the doublings are going to be that big uh, that the last period where we're going to experience collapse, where the economy is going to be so big that one more doubling will completely collapse the resources or cause pollution, is going to be a comparatively uh, small period of time. How does this uh, bore in terms of data? Because we are 50 years after. Were they correct in what they predicted or not? And what I'm saying here is based on an article I wrote with a team of seven or eight, uh, seven, we are eight in total, more uh, scientists, ecological economists, and that we are planning to publish this year on the, on the occasion of the 50 years from the limits to growth, where we are revisiting the data and we are looking at where do we stand in relationship to that uh, prediction. And what we find is that more or less we are in line with a model that predicted that was, let's say, optimistic in terms of our capacity to find more resources for a while, technological capacity, but where collapse comes uh, because of pollution, which more or less fits the picture that we have right now that uh, the economy is on a very dire uh, situation, uh, given the impacts on the climate and the impacts from climate are gonna kick back to the economy and kick back um, to societies leading to undesirable um, consequences. So our scientific analysis finds that more or less we are in this path and that this path spells a serious trouble starting now and uh, at the best case scenario within the next 20, 30 years. And that's not very different from what you might have heard uh, from the IPCC. If you saw the news yesterday, the IPCC is the institution of scientists uh, at the UN level that produces the best and most uh, consensual knowledge around climate change. And they said, like, we're doing really bad. We are not going to meet the target that was set by governments in Paris, which was to keep the change of temperature within 1.5 degrees Celsius. That it's not good. It's what we are already living. Uh, but at least it's not likely to be as catastrophic as it will be uh, hitting the planet more than 1.5. So what they are saying is that we are really bound um, to cross 1.5 degrees Celsius and actually very soon, the way governments uh, are going and the way the economies are going. So that's one part of what I want to talk about, uh, limits to growth and the prospect of this economic growth uh, to lead uh, to a societal, uh, very undesirable uh, consequences. I don't know if this inspires you, probably doesn't inspire you, probably depresses you. That's what some students in our master's program tell me. I came here to take inspiration, but I had, I leave the master and now I have anxiety or depression. I hope that's not the case because my understanding of humanity is that we've always lived through very difficult periods. And that period is uh, likely to be uh, perhaps more difficult than anything in the past but not necessarily in relative terms more difficult than what people lived in other dark periods of humanity. And it is in this period that humans come together, um, they organize, uh, they challenge the powers uh, that create the disasters. And it's also the, the moments um, where human, humanity's history changes. It's through these difficult moments. So if I can inspire you a little bit, I would say that we are not doomed and we are not doomed because we are humans and we know that we humans know how to come together in difficult uh, situations and um, solve problems and also throw away those who cause these problems. In this particular case, I would say those who cause the problems 
are the 1% uh, of capitalist elites who hold economic and political power in their hands and they want the system to keep moving the way it's moving so that this power doesn't slip away from uh, their hands. The second part of what Joseph talked about and what I want to talk today in the remaining nine minutes um, is how to think about limits and that's based uh, on my book Limits which is not a scientific book, it's more a philosophical book, it's more an intellectual book, it's more a humanities book of personal stories and has a lot of cinema in it. Uh, so if anyone wants to translate it in Czech, I would be very happy to bring you into contact with my publishers at Stanford. We've already published it in Japanese, in Greek, uh, Spanish and Catalan, obviously, and French. So there is some interest for people to read the book in different languages. And the book makes a very, a very specific argument, or two arguments, let's say. The first argument is that under capitalism, our relationship to the idea of limits is uh, quite uh, paradoxical, if not schizophrenic, in a sense. On the one hand, we are constantly worried about these limits, the collapse that I was warning you about right now. Like we are saturated with images. I don't know if anyone watched this uh, French TV series called Collapse now. This image of the absolute limit and then of society civilization collapsing as a result. And at the same time, uh, there is a constant obsession and cultural saturation uh, with the idea of overcoming limits. From going to your gym and hearing like there are no limits, you can do whatever you want, or reading a coaching book that tells the same, to the obsession of Elon Musk or uh, Bezos to take a spacecraft and escape Earth, or to the crazy ideas of tech entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley that they will be able to take their brain thought and store it into chips and then have these chips uh, live forever. All these are obsessions quite strong in humanity, especially under capitalism of overcoming limits. And I argue in my book uh, that we can understand the, the history of capitalism as a history of a system that needed to invoke limits in order to galvanize all powers to combat and overcome these limits. You can think here of the colonization of the Americas uh, from the British. There was a lot of thinking at the time, <clears throat> at least by uh, a priest who became economist called Thomas Robert Malthus and with whom I deal in my book that England was limited, the space of the island was very limited, population could no longer grow in the island. And then this was the whole momentum of colonizing and exterminating people in other parts of the world that they were seen as uh, free and unoccupied. Now, the whole machine of capitalism works like that. So there is there is perceived to be always scarcity. So there is never enough for everyone to live a good life. There, are, there is always a limit. Like you will never hear, you know what, this country is rich enough. Well done, you know, they don't need to be any more rich. Or you'll never hear any person saying, rich person saying, oh, you know, Elon Musk has more than enough now. So he's gonna stop trying to have more, you know, he's, he's done pretty well, no? That's not the logic of capitalism. The logic of capitalism is that you never have enough why? Because there are poor people, because you could do more things. So there is always like a sense of scarcity, which is real under capitalism, because capitalism never re redistributes the wealth that it produces. So even countries that they are many times more rich than they were before, still they have poor people. So like England has as many poor people as it had 50 years ago, and the economy is three times bigger. I guess uh, you could say the same for most other Western countries. So in that sense, Capitalism is a system that there is never enough, there is always a limit, there is always scarcity, but at the same time, this image of not having enough is galvanized for overcoming this limit. So it's a, it's a justification of why the system needs more and more economic growth and why this economic growth is never supposed to be enough and it's never supposed to stop. So like, okay, we've grown enough. There is never, there is never enough under capitalism. That's the main argument I make in the book. And to that, I juxtapose ideas that one can find in their uh, 
uh, local intellectual histories or traditions or spiritualities. I trace it on my own roots or on the roots on which I've been educated, and that's classical Greece and the, um, the Athenian democracy of classical times, where there are very strong ideas of um, a good life being a life lived with, within limits. And that a life without, without limits is a, li a life in which you cannot be free, because only if you know your limits and you know your desires and you know how to satisfy them, you are a free person. If you're a person who doesn't know what uh, he or she wants, then you're a person lost in this life where nothing will ever satisfy you. This was a basic wisdom in classical Greece. There were tragedies around that. Um, there were common says. Uh, there were stories people were telling about themselves. They were the way they were exercising. There was what the philosophers were writing about. But it's not only Greece. You take Buddhism, some of you might do meditation to relax from the stressful life of producing documentary films. Uh, you will know too <laughs> all this wisdom, no? So it's not a property of Greece. It's property of all societies. Uh, and all societies have this common sense of a good life being a life that is sufficient and that knows what it is asking for. It is this notion of limits, of limits, as a spiritual value and most of all political project because you cannot just limit yourself you need to have a society that allows you to limit yourself that i reclaim in this book and that i link uh, to what we call the degrowth movement i argue that the degrowth movement with all its proposals for policies economic policies social policies environmental policies uh, in order to stop this catastrophic uh, unfolding of the economy towards endless economic growth. This movement, I argue, is a movement, it's a movement, it's a part of the ecological movement and the social justice movement, that what it does is it revives uh, this wisdom that has traveled through time, through different spiritual movements and social movements, uh, from the Romantics to anarcho-feminists in the beginnings of the 20th century, to the environmental movement in its most radical edges, um, to many different uh, uh, waves of thought and waves of, if you want also, intellectual thought and artistic expression that have challenged uh, this fake dream of capitalism, uh, of endless, of unlimited desires that they require an endless expansion in order to be satisfied, but never really satisfied because they are infinite and they will never be satisfied. Now to finish, in my book, and without realizing it, I got a little bit into culture and art and how do we think about limits, which I didn't do, do it explicitly. Um, but somehow it came up, you know, and now retrospectively I realized there was a lot of it in it. Uh, there was a lot of it in it, why? Because the main metaphor I use in the book to explain my notion of limits comes from a movie, uh, The Legend of 1900, is a Giuseppe Tornatore movie um, based on a theater play from a writer from Naples. It's basically the, the story of a person who is born and lives all his life in a, in a, in a boat uh, that travels, you know, it's, it's the 1900s and it travels from Europe to the US, does this trip. And this guy stays always there and refuses to go out, you know, so I'm not going to spoil the movie for you. To, in, most, in most of my presentations, I spoil movies, so I say exactly what happens to the end to make my my thesis, I'm not gonna do it today because you, some of you might be filmmakers and you say, who is this idiot academic who spoils movies? I don't want him again in any presentation. He might spoil my own movie. I'm not gonna spoil anything, but watch the movie in the 1900s because it is, an, it is a play, a theater play and a, and a plot that captures this notion of uh, limits with all its contradictions and all its problems. And in my book, I contradict that, I contradict also the form and the plots, but also the form uh, of ancient Greek tragedies, which I argue they were also stories of limits and of self-limitation. I contradict that, that uh, to the Hollywood plot, uh, which on the contrary is the capitalist, 
It's a capitalist dream uh, symbolized in the plot where there is always a hero who in the first one third of the movie uh, encounters a limit, an enemy, some challenge, and then the rest of the movie is spent with the hero fighting the limit and then the happy end, which is normally the case for Hollywood movies, is the hero beating the limit, overcoming the limit. And arguing that in different presentations at some point, I saw also the connection, you know, like the Hollywood, where is Hollywood? It's the far west. Where is the far west? It's the end point of British colonization, uh, Anglo colonization of the Americas. It is a point where the capitalist dream reached in its extreme. And it is the place uh, where the justification of this capitalist dream is reproduced to our days. Is this dream uh, of limitless growth, uh, which uh, will not have a happy end, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you, um, Georgos. Um, I will now um, ask a few questions that I have been uh, thinking of in, in the weeks uh, before uh, this uh, debate. Um, and uh, maybe, maybe let's, um, let's start with sticking to the um, idea of freedom and, and the, this, this problematic of of freedom and of, of, of limits and self-limitation or outside limitation in the sense that it's also that freedom is invoked as a defense of the growth economy and of the system. And we have seen this recently also in the Czech uh, public sphere in 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 the West and in the in the Anglo uh, in the Anglophone world, the idea of degrowth is provoking a lot of backlash, a lot of a lot of anger, a lot of shitstorms. Uh, so sometimes uh, sometimes um, sometimes it's pretty uh, emotional, harsh, and um, and probably. Um, it, it's showing that the, the the idea of degrowth is definitely like touching a nerve in the collective psyche of the uh, of our uh, civilization, and um, and we also had this like uh, this year. It, it's like a year of degrowth uh, becoming a major topic of debate, also in the Czech. Um, in some parts, at least, of the Czech public uh, debate. We had the first uh, uh, degrowth conference in Brno, uh, and so on. And, um, and recently, there has been uh, probably the first, uh, first uh, opinion piece published in the Czech media, which basically is a, is a harsh criticism of the idea of, of, of degrowth. Um, and it's, the argument is completely taken, it's just copied from a book that came out recently. It's from an economist from Harvard University, which I think is uh, um, uh, typical. Uh, his name is Alessio Terzi, uh, and uh, he wrote this book recently go called Growth for Good, and it's this um, vigorous defense of, of the idea of economic growth, and basically the arguments that uh, Andrzej Hoska, this journalist from from the from Hospodarska Noviny, from the Economics Daily, um, um, the, the argument is twofold. There are two arguments. One of them is that actually we need growth uh, to stop the climate crisis. The the title of the of the opinion piece literally is "Growth, Growth, Growth." There's <laughs> growth has to be three times in the title so that you don't miss it. Growth, growth, growth. It's the only thing that can stop global warming. And anyone who says otherwise wants to take away our freedom. And so the argument is twofold. One is that we need growth because growth is what fosters innovation, new technology that can displace the bad technology. And if that's not, um, if that's not uh, uh, convincing enough, 
um, it's also that a non-growing economy would necessarily be unfree because in the capitalist economy you have freedom of choice in the marketplace you can choose uh, whatever it's your choice uh, you are free to choose um, in an in, in a degrowth economy in a non-growing economy it couldn't be that way the, the, he uses an example of uh, in a growth economy if your grandma is sick, you can take a car and drive her to the hospital. For some reason, he doesn't think of a public ambulance. I don't know why, but, uh, um, but that's the argument. Uh, whereas in an eco-socialist degrowth economy, everybody would have to make all the decisions together or they would have to be done by a bureaucratic top-down authority. So my question is what your, what your responses to such arguments would be. Um, how is it with, de would degrowth uh, end innovation and, uh, and, and would a degrowth society necessarily be unfree? Because when you say that someone wants to take away your freedom, you know, it's this way of like, yeah, they have to be evil if they want to take away other people's freedom, right? But I don't believe uh, Georgos to be evil, so. Uh, I'm saying I'm not evil, evil but uh, <laughs> who knows what is evil and what is good, you know, of course. Uh, I don't think any, any, any person is evil, you know, I think people are contradictory in general saying, and even the ones I most disagree, I don't think, of, maybe there are, I don't know, a couple of evil people. But, um, First of all, about ecological conditions, I don't know what this journalist knows or the author. The author works for the European Commission, actually, not for Harvard, but the book, the book was published by Harvard. Uh, he's also not an environmental scientist. I don't know what they know. I, I know what I know. I know what I study. I know what I publish. I know the models we do with my students. And if they know something better, I would like to see it. Uh, I mean, the mathematics are not very diff difficult. Something that turns to infinity is not sustainable. And it, when we go to the specifics in terms of carbon emissions, like an economy that's going to be 10 times bigger by the end of this century, is very, very unlikely to not be an economy that hasn't destroyed the climate. Even in the most science fiction scenarios that doesn't destroy the, the climate, it will destroy other things in order to save the climate. And that's the story of economic growth up to now. It's a, uh, I mean, economists are people who are trying to defend the system at all costs. You know, they're like kind of like the priests were in the feudal area era. Now you have the economists, you know, and they're gonna tell you, no, everything is fine. Don't worry, capitalism is working fine. They can make very clever arguments to tell you why growth can keep taking place even without using resources. But anyone who is a normal person, and of course, anyone who is a natural scientist even more, they understand that you cannot have production without using resources and that more and more production would mean more and more resources, more and more transformation, more and more buildings, more and more sand coming out of the earth, more and more minerals, more and more waste. I mean, it's really obvious, but then of course you have very clever people that they study most of their life in Harvard to, to disprove the obvious, you know, and they are, I mean, they are very clever. And then there are of course people who share their ideology and they are happy to reproduce these uh, this clever arguments. Now they are clever, but they are wrong. I'm sorry, I don't know, that's the problem. And I, don't, I don't think this makes me good or evil. No? Uh, it's just like a matter of fact and a matter of reality. Now about freedom, uh, freedom is a big uh, is a big word, and it's normally used by those who uh, are in a powerful the way the, the way you put it. It's used by those who. Because freedom was a, is, is a great ideal. No? It was the ideal of, of the French Revolution, you know. But the French Revolution was ag against those who were holding the power and were screwing all the rest. And it was like, we want to be free, you know. We want to live our lives in full potential and we want to create a society here that we all live a good life. And it's like enough with you keeping us in our chains. And that was freedom. Now, freedom in our times and since Ronald Reagan and many others has taken this peculiar idea of freedom, which is like, it's the freedom of those who already have a lot of power and more or less can do whatever they like to keep doing it. You know, it's like, no, I'm gonna do whatever I like, no matter what 
what I coach to you or anyone else. That's that's not the idea of freedom that has any relationship to anything written in political theory or in any spiritual teaching. You know, it's a, it's a very perverse idea of freedom. So it's the idea, you know, what I'm gonna use my car no matter what. Am I going to to make it impossible for you to use your bike? Fine, I'm gonna use my car because I like to use my car. Am I going to destroy the climate and your kid is gonna live like a climate refugee 50 years from now because I want I want to emit petroleum now to drive my grandmother around to to the shopping mall. I'm, I'm gonna keep doing it, you know. And what happens to you, I don't care because I have the power to keep doing it and it's my freedom to keep doing it. So that's the dominant idea of freedom uh, defendant. Because if we think in more complicated terms, your freedom to use the car encroaches on my freedom to use my bike. The question is not, let's all be free. The question is like, who, who is going to do what is necessary to do? And my argument is that my freedom to use the bike comes before your freedom to use your car because my bike is not putting your life in danger. If I fall in with my bike in your car, I'm not gonna kill you. Plus my bike is not emitting carbon. So it's not making anyone uh, risk their life in the future. So in that sense, it is a freedom, but it's a freedom what we are arguing of doing things differently. So I, I really do feel that those who advocate the growth are not free right now. As many other people in this society, they are not free. The people who produce our cell phones and they extract under dire conditions, minerals in Africa, or they work for, for pitans in factories in Bangladesh, are they free? No, they're not free. So we're talking about their freedom and their freedom uh, or the, not to talk about the people already suffering the climate climate impacts and we're going to multiply in the future. So we're talking about their freedom and their freedom requires a change of the current uh, production and consumption model. This is in order to make people live freer and more dignified uh, lives in the future. And that's the argument in my book that limiting growth and limiting also unlimited desires that they are catastrophic is the only way to maintain a certain level of freedom. Uh, it's also if you want in a more philosophical way, and this is where I use the metaphor of uh, the movie, The Legend of 1900, is only when you have like a limit within which you can create, uh, that you can freely express also your creativity and your desires. Like think of a piano, it's a limited keyboard, so it's not infinite. A canvas to paint is limited, you know. You need these limits in order to create. When they give you this ridiculous choice of one million products to, to do the same thing, you know, in a supermarket, is this freedom? No, I, I would argue that's like taking away my freedom. I just want two things and let me choose between two, you know. I don't want one million. That's my freedom, to be able to live a life that is dignified, that is creative, and that has meaning. Now, also to, to dispel a little bit this myth that economic growth brings freedom, let us say that we see that Western societies are getting less and less, let's say, liberal in the standard sense of the term, you know, in the sense that inspired you in the Czech Republic. Uh, they are getting less and less free in that sense, and that often is justified in the name of growth. And also if we think of the society that right now is economy that it's experiencing the higher growth, uh, that is China. And you explain to me how China is a free society or it's getting freer uh, as time passes. So this myth uh, that economic growth brings freedom uh, or that economic growth takes place in, the, in order to bring freedom uh, is maybe a myth that would make sense to someone 40 years ago, but not today. Which, which, which Western country is getting is getting more free, you know, which country? I mean, all the countries are just saying like, you will not be able to do this and that, you're gonna continue living in poverty, we're gonna cut all the social support we were giving you. You're not gonna have a public hospital to, to drive your grandmother, you know, you're gonna have to, to die or be super rich in order to pay her. Why? Because we need the economy to keep growing and capitalists to keep being happy that they make more and more profit. So that has nothing has, has nothing to do with freedom. Thank you. Um, I think also it's, um, and this is, 
this is related to the to the to the problematic of of limitation and and self limitation that quite often uh, it's the necessity to do something about the environmental crisis is framed as it is necessary to use less so are people willing to limit themselves this is like a, this is a literal uh, phrasing how it's often often framed and and then it's very easy to make the argument like if we stopped growing if we had a degrowth or post growth economy um it would be a form of um limitation and also w it would make us poorer you know it's and then and then s quite often the discourse of environmentalist sounds like yeah yeah we need to limit ourselves we need to limit our desires and expectations we need to use less we basically need to make ourselves poorer for the future generations but quite often the argument of of the proponents of degrowth is really the opposite you know saying no really like from the from the perspective for example of abundance of time you know people being overworked and actually working more than 50 years ago in most western societies or um in other terms that it's not just that the transition to the it, there is besides the argument that the transition to a post growth economy is necessary from a biophysical sense there is also the argument that it is desirable in the in the social and psychological sense that it's something that we should want because it would actually make us better off in many aspects so i wanted to ask you to to explain what is behind this argument really and uh and maybe it's also an opportunity because quite often the 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 discussion gets very abstract to to take a little bit of of a look beneath the concepts at, li at like how would how would the life in a degrowth economy what would the life in a degrowth economy look look like <laughs> like what how how could it look like and and why should we why we might desire it <laughs> or why we might actually like living in a degrowth economy better than living in this one so let's compare a bicycle to a car okay a bicycle uses less materials to be produced, emits less carbon, uh, travels slower, uh, and does what it does. So that's less. Is this less a sacrifice? Not necessarily. I mean, it depends. Uh, staying stuck in traffic the whole day, uh, being able to go in the city and move around uh, with your bike, that doesn't seem to me a sacrifice if a city becomes hospitable to to bikes um, is this a retrogression is it something that sacrifice that we have less no i mean you might argue there are people of lesser abilities there is the old grandma that needs to go to the hospital we didn't say ban all the cars you know or get them there on bicycles on the back of your bicycle you know but uh, you can have like uh, the extra things for for the extra needs you might have, but the normal form of mobility, not the only one, I insist, but the normal one right now is the car, could become the, the, the bike and the train. This would lead to less resource use, less pollution, less, less, less. Is this less a sacrifice? No. Is this less bad? No. Uh, consider another example, you know, like average family in the US, I don't know how many times they eat meat uh, per week or in Europe, uh, what sort of meat they are eating, from where it's coming, uh, what quality it is, in what form they are eating it, etc., etc., or or uh, or synthetic food, etc., that uses chemicals, it's processed, it needs factories in order to be processed, etc. Let's say we manage to transition uh, to a more balanced diet that is based on locally sourced food, that it's on a closer distance, uh, that it's closer to the way we were eating some decades ago and we were, and we were healthier in most societies uh, that it uses meat products on special occasions on the sunday on the day that i don't know you celebrate something etc and on the other days is a varied data based on 
uh, on a variety of, uh, of vegetables and other sorts of proteins, etc. I'm not saying everyone become vegan, okay? Like you have the freedom to, we have the freedom to become vegans. And there is also the, the possibility of transitioning to a much more balanced and locally sourced uh, diet. Again, this would reduce carbon emissions. We know that from science. This would reduce land use, would reduce resource use. At the same time, it would make us healthier. I mean, people are paying money and money to get diets to just hear that they have to get the Mediterranean diet, which is how my grandmother was eating, you know, without knowing that she was eating the Mediterranean diet. And she was like a thin, a beautiful lady. I, I almost said healthy, but she wasn't healthy because she was smoking a lot, which wasn't fun. <laughs> anyway, she get many diseases, but because of smoking, you know, which was another industrial encroachment in her life. But um, so again, is this less something that it's worth? Now, let's say uh, that we produce less in general, and that means we're going to work also less. So we're going to stop producing in a degrowth society things that they are um, not necessary in the sense that they are not satisfying some basic uh, material needs that we have in terms of clothing, in terms of heating, in terms of living a, a decent life. So a lot of production, we might argue, is, uh, is unnecessary in a context of climate change and we stop this production and models show that this would mean we would have to work less. Okay, we would have to work less in our office and go to our factory wherever, wherever we happen to work. And then we're gonna have more time to be with our friends, uh, make love, make jokes, joke with our friends, uh, have fun and uh, walk around and marvel in our city, etc. You know, at a more relaxed pace than the one we have right now that we are working eight hours per day and then we are also three hours per day for checking our WhatsApp and Telegram. Um, is this less again going to be worse? Is it going to be a sacrifice? No, it's not going to be a sacrifice. At least for me, it's not a sacrifice. It's going to be much nicer. You're going to tell me, okay, if it's so nicer, why don't you do it already? And this is where it's important to think of a, of a transition as a structural transition, as a societal transition, as an organizational transition, because Yes, if you live in London and you take your bike and you go out, it's at your own risk, you know, like so many cyclists are killed every week because like trucks can still go in the center of the city and they crash on bicyclists. If I want to have a more healthy and balanced diet, yes, I have to pay a lot and go to specialized organic stores uh, that they sell things more expensive, etc, etc, you know, if I want to work less. I'm going to get less salary and probably the way society and I don't want to check my telegram and WhatsApp every minute, I'm going to fall behind uh, in my current job that is structured around these things. So this is why we're saying it's a personal and a structural change. And it's a personal and a structural change towards a more developed, if you want, a more advanced future where we finally enjoy the fruits of what we have been producing and what we are able to, to do rather than keep being poor and keep uh, running faster and faster in order to produce more and more to remain as poor and get poorer than before and also uh, see our freedoms being taken away. Mm. In, the <coughs> in the current economic crisis, uh, the trends towards larger and larger economic inequality is, is deepening also in Czech Republic. Like uh, more and more people are, it's harder and harder for them to pay their uh, electricity bills and rents while uh, basically everyone in the 100 uh, richest uh, uh, Czechs have got richer during the uh, COVID pandemic uh, energy crisis and then the crisis uh, um, caused by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, and so it's really hard to imagine this kind of transition and, and this uh, cutting of production and uh, freeing people to have much more free time and so on. It's also like uh, people 
a lot of people don't want to have to work less uh, in, in, in today's society, right? Because if you talk to them, because for them it's like they have to, they have to, they need the money <laughs> to pay for the uh, uh, commodified uh, life necessities. Um, and what I'm getting at, it, it's hard to imagine it without a, a, a major redistribution of wealth, uh, incomes, uh, property. Um, and in this sense, like, degrowth is, um, is aligned or inspired or, or, or is also, like, connected to the, to the, the other traditions of, of critique uh, of capitalism and proposals to transform it uh, in the past. Mostly, I would say, traditions of, of, uh, of uh, libertarian uh, and democratic uh, socialism, social democracy, or, or, uh, or anarch anarchism, or socialism in, in general. And I would say that you are one of the people in the post-growth debate who are most open uh, uh, about this. Um, Mm, you have also co-authored the, the, a, a, a manifesto called "For an Eco-Socialist Degrowth," uh, literally, and this like um, this raises uh, an issue in the Czech debate because uh, in in Czechoslovakia, as in other countries of the former Soviet bloc, we obviously have a trauma from the uh, from the state socialist. Uh, dictatorship from authoritarian uh, socialism, and that's a that's a th that's some kind of experience that in 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 many ways we share with Greeks. Actually, I was uh, when doing my research on the on the debate, uh, it, I, I was surprised to learn, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that that your uh, mother has been uh, imprisoned for opposing a dictatorship in Greece, which was not a socialist dictatorship, it was a standard capitalist uh, dictatorship. But, uh, um, but so what I'm getting at is like, what do you mean by this socialism <laughs> that you talk about? Or how to, how to approach this trauma of trying to transform or overcome capitalism and ending in a, in a, um, in a dictatorship in which actually Actually, th the also often then, then there is this argument like, so you're criticizing capitalism because it's destroying the planet, but the, S the Soviet model was no better in, in, in the, at this. Like in, in many uh, senses, it was, it was uh, similarly or, or, or even uh, more destructive of the environment. And uh, I believe this is a uh, topic that needs uh, addressing. So. Uh, that's a question I wanted to pose to you when you talk of socialism. What kind of socialism do you mean? And, uh, and um, how would it uh, guarantee people's uh, freedom and basic uh, liberties? Yeah, there are many questions there and it's a big, huge discussion. Uh, but like, let, to repeat what you said, so you said that people would have to work less under the current system. There is hundred uh, rich people that they get richer and richer and then the rest have to work more and more in order to keep up. So forget socialism, forget capitalism, forget using any of these big terms that are historically loaded. So your very logic was like, okay, if these people have to work less in order to be okay in the planet and also because it's fair, you know, and they maintain the same salary, which is not a crazy idea, you know, like Roosevelt in the US in the 1930s, who by now by today's standards would be considered an extreme socialist. He was the president of the US. When there was the Great Depression, uh, he cut the hours people worked. They were working 45 hours per week. He cut them to 35 and he kept the same salary. He didn't reduce their salary. And of course, this I don't think it's something that many people uh, would not like apart from a few workaholics um, that they really like what they're doing now. Yeah, well, this is the idea, like, okay, there, there, is, there is a crisis, we need to work less and we redistribute from those that have made uh, and they have unnecessarily much. So, you know, you say they would have to redistribute property and it sounds like you're going to take the house of someone, you know, and that, I mean, that's misleading because it sounds like, okay, it's going to happen what happened 
In the Soviet era, that you would take the house of someone and divide it in three, and then three families would enter inside. You know, that's not the idea. Right now, you have corporations. In Berlin, for example, 10% of all the houses are owned by corporations that they own more than 3,000 apartments in the city each, you know. Now that's, that's a crazy amount of... And then people in Berlin cannot afford to pay rent to stay in the city, and they have to move out and then commute two or three hours every day to go to the center of the city to work. This is uh, grotesquely unequal, you know, so that these people can have 3,000 apartments and keep making money in the stock exchange. Like the majority of Berliners have to travel two or three hours per day and live miserable lives. Uh, you don't need to call it socialism to say that, okay, these people cannot have 3,000 houses. And this was a, a referendum that the people in Berlin did, you know, and we're going to take that from them. So whoever has more than 3,000 houses, <laughs> which sounds to me quite a lot to have, no? Well, we're going to take these extra houses and redistribute them to the city, plus have a minimum rent. To me, I don't know if you want to call this socialism. Call it whatever you, you, you want. You know, I call it uh, human development. I think it's like what needs to be done and what is reasonable and what is just, and everyone understands it. You don't need to, to be in favor of socialism or not. Now, I have argued in favor of eco-socialism in the sense of pointing to a system that would put distribution first, would put the ecology first, and uh, would also have a certain degree of uh, government care for the economy that it's considered anathema right now in extreme capitalist countries like the US or the UK, but not like in um, progressive and advanced capitalist countries that you might say are countries like the Scandinavian or perhaps Korea or Japan, like more progressive uh, capitalist countries already have a sense of the state as being an important and responsible actor, and I think more of that is necessary. We use the term eco-socialism for that, and the echo is very important because it distinguishes us from those who might argue that an industrial kind of socialism, uh, which would do more or less what capitalism promises it can do now in terms of the environment, etc., but would be socialistic, that would be uh, solving the problem. So I don't think that any type of socialism uh, would be good in terms of environmental issues, but also in terms of uh, generally the human predicament. It has to be a democratic socialism, a decentralized one, uh, and one that it's ecological and it's the growth in the sense of producing and less and redistributing more. Uh, Soviet Union was nothing like that now it wasn't a system that came it came in a very different period of time in a very different uh, objectives soviet union in a, in a way invented economic growth it was Khrushchev in the 1950s that said we're going to grow the economy we're going to double it the next decade and then the americans responded etc um, so it was a growth economy i don't see the, the example of now and of course it wasn't explicitly ecological so why would it be ecological they were doing what the others were doing too, which was trying to grow and produce as many goods as possible. First, to have a strong army, and second, to, to have a satisfied people, which was also what the two blocks were doing. Now, the Soviets did it in a way that uh, uh, was authoritarian and undemocratic, as you correctly said, and as you correctly, correctly revolted against uh, in Czechoslovakia in, 68 and then again in the 90s so there isn't any uh, effort to beautify any of that now the soviet story is a very particular story it was a revolution that started from particular people in a particular period of time and within a military context so it started as a war economy and unfortunately it remained to our date um, a war economy now the question is is russia better than soviet union though it's capitalist i'm not so sure you, you might want to debate that, but I'm not so sure, you know. Um, was Greece better than Czechoslovakia? It was very good that you brought this example. No, we were living also in, in dictatorship. So my family wasn't free at all, you know. There was like a person following my mother whenever she was going out of the house or father to see what newspaper they buy. Then they were keeping notes on them. And then at some point they arrested them because of the newspapers they were reading. So. No, we didn't live in freedom either. I think it's like an illusion that the West lived in freedom while the East uh, 
uh, was living under oppression. We were all living under oppression because the two big blocks were having a big fight and the rest of us, we were like the periphery to them. And in the periphery, they were just having dictatorships. Uh, it's the same thing in Latin America. Like, do you know what Argentina went through under capitalism? Probably worse than, sorry to say so, but worse than what you went through, you know? Argentina, like, there were people like killed families. I have friends, their families were abducted, killed, thrown from helicopters, you know, like blinded, like, you know, there was Indonesia. What happened in Indonesia, you know? Like thousands, days, hundreds of thousands of students and of people just executed. <clears throat> You've seen the documentary probably. Uh, executed because of their political beliefs. So this was a, like a dire uh, part of human, a human history as any period is a dire part of human history. So to, to refer to that part of history as saying, oh, that was socialism and socialism is always like that. So capitalism is the best system and it can never change. Seems to me like a very narrow and short-sighted way of understanding human affairs. So to, in conclusion, eco-socialism is not the socialism uh, that you experienced. Uh, it's not something that we have experienced and it's something of course that has its risks. Uh, if it were ever to happen, I mean, I don't know how it would happen, but there is nothing in its constitution and in the ideas of the people who write about it that it's not democratic, that it's uh, challenging the idea of freedom or anything like that. Thank you. Um, we have some time now. I, I would uh, be uh, up for uh, debating with Georgos the whole afternoon, but uh, now there's um, uh, opportunity for you to pose your uh, questions. I'm not sure where to do it if you're you're supposed to come here and um, I will lend you the microphone. No, there is a microphone there uh, by a um, friend in a white uh, t-shirt. So if you want to ask some question of Georgos, I see a hand raised in the very back. Yep. Hello, do you hear me, Georgos? Thank you, I'm Vincent Bocek. Uh, there is one critics of the degrowth movement which says that the degrowth movement will never be able to overcome its name degrowth because because it has a uh, negative connotations and because it is uh, or it, the critics says it is politically unacceptable or are unacceptable and the critics is as i as i've seen is also shared by the one of the one of the of uh, of the limits to growth of the book, Dennis uh, Dennis Meadows, and he says, or he suggests to build uh, a society or a movement with exactly the same methods and same goals, but to call it a society for human happiness. What's your opinion on this, and how do you cope with these critics? Thank you. Uh, human happiness is a little bit too cheesy, I think. Uh, I don't know if it's easy translating <laughs> in Czech. It doesn't translate into Greek, so, but uh, uh, too sweet and like happiness. Yeah, everyone wants to be happy, but no one can be really happy, you know, like happiness is elusive. So to create a society for human happiness, no, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> but the, the purpose of the growth, what is it? The purpose of the growth is to criticize the dominant idea of our times, which is economic growth. So as a critique, I think it works and it is necessary there. As long as people think that degrowth is not a good word, it is necessary because it means that still the idea of growth is dominant and accepted. Once people are going to say like, growth is uh, crazy and whoever a politician like Liz Truss in England says that she's for growth and against anti-growth, we, we, <laughs> we kick her out. So once this is the dominant idea, then the growth is not necessary anymore because indeed it doesn't capture what needs to be done. But as long as the dominant idea is growth, you need the growth as a critique. Uh, what are the, the, um, the positive terms? I, li I like the term conviviality. Uh, I like it because it emphasizes uh, that a good society is a society of friendship, a society of interacting, a society of coming together and doing things and living well together. 
So I like conviviality plus I like it because it's not um, historically loaded, no? Because, you know, when once we talk about eco-socialism, there is, of course, for good reasons, this whole discussion about socialism, but is this socialism or that socialism, you know? So conviviality is something that hasn't been tried and it's nice. So it's a one I like, it's a one I like, I think. Thank you. Uh, more questions? Yeah, I see a hand there. Thank you. Um, sorry, um, there are new terms now about just transition or uh, environmental transition of economy. Do you think that if performed suitably, it can change the situation, the global economic situation, or it's just, I don't know, some wishful thinking? I think just transition is important because just transition in a narrow sense, what does it mean? It means a transition where uh, you take into account the interests of workers. So you're not doing a transition just for the sake of doing a green energy transition and then whoever loses their job or have to pay more for energy, they are thrown on the side. But you do it in a way that you make sure um, that the interests of people are taken into account. So I'm... Um, I'm 100% with that. It's not, of course, what we are seeing now, even in the best case of the European Green Deal, which is this uh, program of uh, expanding renewable energy in Europe, etc. It's far from being just in the sense that it's mostly market driven and, you know, markets are not just. They are, they are what they are, you know, like whoever is fired is fired. And, if you have to pay more for your electricity bill, you have to pay more. You see now that there are some incipient efforts to try to limit just for a year or so and until we see what happens with the war, to limit how much people will pay and how much profit companies will make. And even that is difficult. So the, this demonstrates how far from a just transition we are, you know, because it, it's much more obvious and immediate to say like, okay, just, distribution of energy costs and profits right now, you know, because of a war, no one should make money in a war, no? I mean, that, they would, they used to be called war profiteers back in the day. So how is it that now it's so difficult to say that it's not fine for sale to make billions of, of profits during a war and instead these billions should be just taken away from sale and used so that people do not pay more for electricity. Anyways, to me, this seems like always an important objective and I'm 100% in favor of a just transition. All I'm saying is that the just transition in an economy that it's going to be 10 times bigger by the end of the century is, is not going to be enough. So you need just transition and, uh, and a slowing down of the economy, which means like reorganizing the economy in different ways. Any more questions? Don't be afraid to ask. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, yes, perfect. Um, I was gonna ask about the idea of limits. I read your book and I really like the persuasive uh, philosophical part. And yet I think where we're struggling a little bit is the, is the policy implications of this. Uh, like there is ideas of, okay, at least ideally, democratically be talking about limiting income. But then how do we tackle the resource use and actually capping resource use? Because I, as much as I've tried, I haven't found any ways of how to actually do this in the globalized economy. And a perfect example is like fast fashion, right? Like you have uh, an economy or like a product that's really useless and yet all these companies want to keep on growing. And yet I think in the policy realm, like I think now there has been a first paper that came out that it's even asking the question, how do, how do we limit this on a global scale? If for instance, you know, us consuming less in the north could really have like a detrimental a mm, outcomes for the people in the global south. Uh, they're already b being exploited, but maybe not having this sort of growth might, might not be the best. So how do we think about limiting these resources and what are some of the political implications or policy implications of that? Like, how do we de design it democratically and how do we then put it in practice? Yeah, these are hard questions you are asking and they're good questions. How, how do you limit particular, 
particular parts of the economy. But I think we can we can start from the diff, super difficult but low hanging fruit. You know, for example, we know that we need to limit how much fossil fuels we extract from the earth, and we know how to limit it, which is simply not to allow to extract it. Right? This sounds very simple, but I mean, physically speaking, it's it's not impossible. You just have to say, like, okay, we're not going to take these fossil fuels or this natural gas out of the earth, and then we're trying to manage the rest. So in that way, it's not super difficult to imagine the policies, as you're saying, or the how to do it, but it's more difficult to imagine the political dynamics and will and power uh, that will make it possible to do it. Then you raise an even more complicated case though that you take a specific sector you know and you say fashion okay how do you um, how do you regulate what's happening there in a, in a globalized economy you know there is a movement of people of activists in the fashion sector that they wrote a manifesto i've seen already a paper then it's a manifesto is out which they call it the fashion and it's about the growth in the fashion sector would be interesting to see what policies they recommend. Again, one could imagine that the government with a reasonable amount of power, we are not talking about a, a communist state that you've experienced. No, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be someone dictating how much its industry is going to produce year after year for five years, etc. You know, it can be like an, a, a reasonable social democratic state with a certain degree of regulatory power that has been completely given to corporate interests now that says that uh, I don't know they set the specifications for the duration of products that they produce or set the specifications for how often a company can uh, can produce new lines of clothes I mean I'm just thinking outside of my head right now because I don't know the fashion sector you know actually we want someone to write a policy brief for us on the growth in the fashion sector so we'll we will ex explicitly look with these things uh, it sounds difficult and it sounds like okay you do it in your country and then what H and M is going to leave and then they're going to just produce for another country but okay if the EU was serious with all these directives that it makes about circular economy and this and that and like I don't think it's impossible to set some rules for fashion industries. So that's like a very light social democracy that I'm saying. But even this, as the redistribution we were talking about, or as taking profits away from energy companies right now, all these things are, I think, doable practically. I mean, you could see how they could happen, and they are very reasonable. But politically, they seem like you are saying now something impossible now. How could you tell age and them that they won't be able to, to change their clothes every two months or whenever they like? It's, I mean, this is the role of government. That's the role of government to say like, we are going to put a limit on that because it's unsustainable or because we have this and that goals in terms of carbon emissions, etc. you know? So you're gonna operate with these lines, produce t-shirts, I mean, I really appreciate t-shirts that last for 10 years. I don't know about you, you know. Uh, I found, I'm, I'm not going to do any advertisement, but I had found like a small company in the US that was doing that. They were making this nice, good looking t-shirts that they last 10 years. I really love them. I mean, I don't know why would this um, not be the norm for everyone. There is there the the fake notion of freedom, no? Let anyone produce whatever t-shirts they like, and if someone likes to buy 10-year du during t-shirts like you, they buy them. If I want to buy t-shirts that last three months, it's also fine. But as I said, that's a false notion of freedom because you who buy a t-shirt every three months is limiting my freedom to have like a, a reasonable summer in Greece because like last summer I, I boiled of heat, you know, because of climate change. So how is it? Whose freedom is taking a precedence there? Thanks. Is it? Okay. Ah, thanks. <laughs> um, so maybe this is a very obvious question with an obvious answer, but um, degrowth would mean cutting down on production, I guess. So that would mean shutting down at least some factories 
um, and the industrial part of the economy, which would lead to people, a lot of people losing their jobs. Is there a simple way, a simple plan that degrowth has to, to tackle this? It's not simple, as it's not simple for any person to lose their job. But I mean, in the context, for example, of just transition, where we know that people who work, for example, in coal mines, etc., uh, would ideally need to lose their job. There's a whole discussion of what just transition means. Okay, how do you retrain these people to work in other industries? But also not how you just move them to other industries, but you also give them the capacity to use the skills that they had, not to feel like that they are completely devalued for what they know, but how like do you repurpose um, their skills to new activities? There is this example of this Boeing factory in the US where workers in the UK, I think it was, where the workers took control in the 1970s and they started with the knowledge they had, the machinery they had, they started producing windmills, for example. So it's like, how do you repurpose these activities? to do something else that is socially useful and not destructive and where people feel valued because the most important for all of us is to feel our work is valued. You are a filmmaker, you want to do something that you feel people value, you know. How would you feel as a filmmaker as they told you, you know, the, your job is very bad for the climate so you're going to stop doing it, you know. Uh, probably you wouldn't like it but then if they told you, you know, now you can do something very different with your capacities and creativities as a filmmaker and everything, you know, you're going to produce another form of art it's super important, you know, and it's super valued. We all value it and love you for doing that. Then it's a different proposition. So one question is that of the transition and of the transition being just. The other is like less production, especially if it's less production of things that they are damaging and they are unnecessary, uh, means we were producing something that was not necessary. So we can do without it and people can simply work less. Uh, it's not necessary to produce it, you know, we can do less and uh, people can work less, less hours. So you you share the work among more people and people work uh, less hours. So we produce less and we work less, which if what we don't produce anymore was damaging or useless, it's fine. If we were producing hospitals and now we work less and we don't have doctors anymore in the hospitals, that's a problem. Uh, but if we were producing bubble gum and then we stop producing bubble gum, I mean, it's fine, you know, and the people who are producing bubble gum, they work less, they live nice lives, we pay them for not producing gum, bubble gums and we don't have bubble gums. It's not a big, big deal, you know. So, uh, so both cases. One is repurposing the economy so that people work in areas where we need work, in social care we need, in health care we need, in energy transition, there is work that needs to be done and that it's not done right now. So repurposing and revaluing the work of people there and working less to the extent that this is possible. There's a question here. Thank you. <coughs> Hello. Uh, I'd like to ask a question or maybe uh, to note on the thing, a lot of contradictions in the things you said. Because, uh, for example, uh, a while ago, you said that uh, you don't want any totality state and you <coughs> cannot say to companies don't produce, uh, I don't know, a set of clothes two times a year or something like that. But then you said, you have to apply some regulations on it. So, you know, you whether don't use regulations or you use it, but then you become authority. And it's the same thing like with the bubble gums. Now, if you <coughs> tell us we don't lose anything, if we ban bubble gums, then you are an authority who says this. But what about people who like bubble gums? Thank you. Yeah, you are an authority, exactly. I mean, you can't, there is no society that is organized without a state that has an authority. There is one thing to have an authority and regulation, and another is to be authoritarian. These two things should not be mixed. I mean, we had a state that said, no, it's not okay to smoke, you know. I didn't ban smoke, but it made it so expensive that people stopped smoking. And if you want in the US that it's the libertarian state of the world, you know, you can't smoke even 
I mean, you can't smoke anywhere. So they basically banned smoke, but they didn't call it banning. They tell you you can't smoke like three meters from the from the building, but then you're in the middle of the highway, you know. So you go smoke there, and they kill you. So it's not you don't have the, the choice to to smoke anymore in the United States, and that's good, you know, because they realized that smoking was having a huge cost in their society, was killing people, and uh, was also having huge impact on the public finances. So there was a decision in that state, probably it's not considered an authoritarian state, but there was a decision by an authority, which is the state, to regulate smoking. Uh, that's how functional, even ca capitalist societies work, you know, they regulate things. They're regulated that you cannot work more than 40 or 45 or 46 hours. They're regulated that children cannot work. All these things were happening, and you could put children to work in the factory. They had small hands and they were making things faster. Or you could have people to work like 60 hours per day in, in stupid jobs that they didn't mind matter if they were tired. So, okay, get them to work 60 hours. There was an authority that regulated. This shouldn't be confused for an authoritarian state. You are not authoritarian if you impose certain limits that they are for the greater good. Now, are bubble gums for the greater you good? You are right. Do what you... You, you are right. We, we can debate whether banning bubble gums I mean, it was an extreme example, no? Feel uh, you, have to do. you might overreach there, you know? So it's, it's always important to keep that in mind. But uh, I don't think we should be afraid of regulation. I mean, regulation is right now. If you see how many regulations your country has or how many regulations uh, European Union has, is an immense amount. They're just regulating other stuff, the wrong stuff. They're regulating that, for example, if you have a if you want to privatize, I don't know, your like, utility, etc., you can't do it. Or if you want to, sorry, if you want to turn a private utility into public, you can't do it. I mean, there are limits. Uh, there are limits what you can do in the, with the European competition market. All sorts of limits all the time. Capitalism also doesn't work without limits and rules and, uh, and regulations. The question is what regulations? So you're right. Yes, you might overreach. But... Uh, my argument is that if we are serious about climate change, if we're serious about overusing resource use and screwing the planet, then limiting how much fast fashion is produced is reasonable. Limiting whether we want to produce bubble gums or work less, etc., is also a reasonable debate. I'm not saying that you need to do it, but it's a reasonable debate as reasonable was uh, to ban smoking. I mean, climate change is going to kill many more people than smoking. So if there was a case for banning smoking, there is an even stronger reason for banning uh, fossil fuels and the industries that produce fossil fuels, and to an extent, then activities that depend on fossil fuels. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at the time. Um, maybe one last question okay hello maybe simple simple question does uh, no growth means stagnation or e even stunting yes but not stagnation within a growth economy you know so the way the, way the term we use there is post growth you know to to signify the need because in the current economy, if you have stagnation, it is a problem and it's a serious problem because you have inequalities increasing, you have people losing their job and then not having opportunities to work, uh, etc. So the question is that yes to stagnation, if you want, not to stagnation, but yes to a steady state of resource use, of output of the economy, etc. But in order for this to be socially sustainable and not to be like a an undesirable situation as it is now, uh, you need transformation, social transformations, policy transformations, institutional transformations. And to that extent, we can even learn from economies, capitalist economies without big changes, but that have managed better uh, stagnation than others. For example, there, there was an interesting paper that I saw just came out last week about the case of Japan, which is an economy that hasn't seen growth the last 30 years, you know, and demonstrates 
how through certain social changes, etc., the well-being of the population there has actually improved rather than disproved, you know. Uh, it has required the state to take care of public expenditures, spend more for public goods, etc. Um, but I think it's interesting because you see already within progressive, socially progressive, I mean, politically Japan is conservative, so it doesn't mean that it has to be progressive in the sense of particular political party. But there are certain structures, historical structures of Japanese society that have led in a way, have made it possible to manage, socially manage this stagnation in a way that hasn't fully um, deteriorated the life of people and instead have uh, led to social improvement. So that would be the idea, not just a stagnation the way we understand zero GDP today. Thank you, uh, Georgos, for being here with us today. Um, I was asked to, at the end, summarize the three main ideas of uh, your contribution here today. Um, I would say that uh, they can be summed up as this, like degrowth or some, point, some form of post-growth transition to a steady state non-growing economy um, is necessary globally from a biophysical sense, because otherwise the growth economy will lead us to uh, an ecological and societal collapse and uh, mass die-off of uh, human populations and uh, other species. Um, uh, but uh, it's not only necessarily necessary, in many ways we can say it is desirable, because it would lead to uh, an economy which needs to produce less and thus also to work less and uh, a one which would be liberating also in many ways and would lead to a greater quality of life even with less material consumption. And the third connected point I would say is that, uh, and I think this was clear in the last um, parts of the debate, is that we shouldn't see limitation and limits only as something negative as a constraint but actually in the real world knowing the limits and being able to consciously work with them in in one word self-limitation whether it is uh, on the personal level or on the societal level in terms of democratic decision making is is not a constraint or free on freedom necessarily but actually it's a condition of true freedom. Thank you, Georgos. Thank you very much.